Hi, I'll pick up where I left off in the last video in the chapter on the brace from Carl Philip Emanuel Box Versuch über die wahre Art das Klavier zu spielen. Aus der Ähnlichkeit dieses Doppelschlags mit einem Triller mit dem Nachschläge folgt, dass der Erstere sich ebenfalls mehr nach hinauf als herunterwärts neigt. Man trillert also bei geschwinden Noten, ganze Oktaven und weiter, bequem durch diese Manier hinauf, aber nicht herunter. Dieser oft vorkommende Fall wird gemeiniglich außer dem Klavier so angedeutet, wie wir bei Figur 53 sehen. Bei geschwinden, heruntergehenden Noten hat also der Doppelschlag nicht statt. Es sei denn, dass derselbe die Stelle eines Trillers bequem vertritt, weil der Letztere etwas schwer fällt, wenn man mehr als eine Stimme anzuschlagen hat. Es wird zu diesem Falle ausdrücklich eine etwas geschwinde Note erfordert, weil sonst die nötige Ausfüllung durch einen Triller wegfallen würde. In the appendix example, I would say the second last bar line should be a double bar line, because Bach is indicating both how that first figure, the B and G going to the A and F sharp, appears in the score with the mordant sign, and then how he means it to be performed with the sign of the brace. So a double bar line would be in keeping with how he usually indicates such scenarios, as he does in the two examples of figure 52, for example. I'm sure that's Berenreiter's error that it is missing. It's been refreshed now in our memories what Box said in paragraph 13. So we can make those connections to this paragraph that Bach, in paragraph 9, invited us to make. This, what Bach is telling us, is an important, significant element of the world outside of the cage and that is the observance of laws of nature as they exist in the world of music. It is only here, on this channel, will you be told such things. You won't find any of this mentioned anywhere. Lilliput, the role of honour, will not tell you that the brace will not work with fast descending notes because they are completely ignorant of such things, because nothing exists in the cage except notes. Ornaments are an onus, not a means of expression. Lilliput will refer you to the metronome, to clever little exercises their professors told them, to grouping, finger strengthening exercises, playing in rhythms, hands separately, to rotation and to all, to all the other nonsense gymnastics that fills their and your days in the cage. Lilliput, the role of honour, and all their victims become a bunch of donkeys chasing an unattainable carrot, applauding those donkeys that appear to get closest to it, oblivious to how they look in the process. Just think of the footage back in the day of all those failed attempts those people made with their flying machines. What would we say, with the benefit of hindsight, to someone who was still practicing the flapping of the wings of their contraption to this day with a metronome, 
moving the metronome up notch by notch, thinking any day now. Would we conclude that the principles of flight could not possibly exist in the cage? Would others in the cage, in the aviation role of honor, be telling that person that what his contraption needs is more wings? <laughs> That footage will be like could be used on a try not to laugh video. It looks com it's comedic. It looks comical. It's only those who escape the cage who, who observed nature were they able to fly. The rest. They were all experts. I'm I would imagine like I was thinking what what would might be a a, a fun film subject. Maybe a comedy or something, but if you imagine like um, Will Ferrell and his, you know, the guy who can't think of his name right now, begins with an Orr Riley or something. Tom Riley, I don't know. But anyway, you know, a, a film where that 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 focuses on one of those people who were building those re failed attempts of flight, you know, and, and how the, the hubris they'd have and how, you know, like the adults are in the room talking and they'd be saying, you know, needs more wings because they already have, you know, like 10 rows of wings stacked on top of each other only to, you know, fall flat. That, that, that could be a, a funny premise. For a film, but the analogy, like it'll go to a certain extent, you could say to them that they are they were exploring new ground. Flight hadn't yet been understood or discovered, so they were so it wouldn't apply. Whereas, you know, the results that Lilliput come up with now, they are coming them up with them after piano has been discovered, how to play the piano has discovered. We've had people like Bach, Mozart and Beethoven exist, who knew how to play the piano. So it's, it wouldn't exactly be one for one, but it is then the ones who ignore, ignore everything that like, that has been learned about the principles of flight and are still trying to get their thing to work. They're exactly the same as, they don't exist because in aviation, you know, it's impossible to overlook the planes that do fly. <laughs> After how many years will they tell you to stop trying that such feats only exist as a figment of the imagination? They'll never tell you that. You're meant to practice with the metronome till the day you die. Have you ever heard of the king who wanted to command the tide to turn back? King Knuti, if that's how you say it. Well, if you look that up, and you might, you might find something where it says this story is often misunderstood. Well, this King Canute, he made a point about the cage. If it's only in your last few breaths do you realize you've been had, that it didn't work, then they'll be pleased with you, that you served them well, like a nice little servant. Catering for their comfort and luxury at your own expense. You are the, to you, for them, you are the best kind of person. That give, that where, where you have, you know, you, you, you totally, you put aside your own self-worth and, and, and to serve them. As you're dying, you can hope to get another shot at life so you can be cleverer the next time round and not let yourself get fooled by such puny, pathetic, tiny little people crawling around on their bellies. 
because there's the insult to the injury. And I mean, I mean, all that is allegorical. <laughs> what Buck is sharing here is an example of the difference between success and failure. It's like the story of Adam and Eve and the apple from the tree of knowledge. And I mention it not in a religious sense, but again, allegorically. I see Adam and Eve as the, and this is my interpretation, of course. I see Adam and Eve as the archetypical man and woman, as prototypes to represent the relationship every man and woman has with the planet, let's say, or existence. And I see it as an ongoing situation as opposed to a once off. Eat the apple and have God's knowledge. Be like God. Only God didn't get that knowledge by eating the apple. So the part of discovering that knowledge, the things that pointed you to the real realization of its existence, getting to know it, realizing its significance, how it's used, where it's applicable, the respect, reverence and awe one cultivates for that knowledge, the extent of that knowledge, the experience of all that, that one carries around with oneself and uses together with the mere having the knowledge, that all is missing. You know, recognizing where that knowledge exists. When you look around, the knowledge is contained within things around you. If you have the knowledge and not the connection to that, the knowledge is useless. The, the best you can do is prattle off a few definitions. That's it. It'll serve you in no way. So it's a catch-22 or a paradox or a contradiction. It is the very eating of the apple that cancels out the ability to be like God or to know all that he knows because it replaces the experience of gaining and absorbing or owning or living with that knowledge, which is something God has, with that of eating an apple. So you're thrown into limbo. You know, when, when applying the knowledge, you might think, or figuring out the right answer, you might think of your experience as you gained that knowledge, as, you've re as you recognized it, as you, 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 the, the significance of it dawned on you. That is what might come to mind when, when, when you're figuring out the right answer in a certain situation. Whereas if you've eaten the apple, all that'll come to mind is the eating of the apple. So, so, so it's all missing. And, and many people would probably have experienced that, that it's, it's their experience that plays a role aside from just having the knowledge itself. If Bach, Mozart or Beethoven were to be asked, how did you get so great? They might present the contents. So, they might present the contents of this book as an answer to illustrate the insight into music that facilitated their great achievements. So this, and not alone this, the connections that can be made in this, this is a flat representation of a, of a, of a, of a, of a more dimensional kind of understanding. This will represent their insight into music. Lilliput, the role of honor, on the other hand, want to persuade you that the way to becoming as great as they were is not by knowing any of this, but by practicing with the metronome through finger independence, muscle memory, and endless repetition. What is the level when they talk about muscle memory? I mean, muscles don't have minds. Muscles don't have brains. Muscles don't have memory. 
they would rather, they, they, they are oblivious to the existence of all that insight, completely oblivious to it. I can't make a single move without encountering their incompetence or their lack of knowledge or having to deal with things that just don't exist in, in, you know, in the classical music sphere. So they, they, they ignore this and go straight to the, 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 the figment of their imagination, mind in their muscle. And that's, that's it. They, they have a, a, a bunch of definitions they know. Imagine having the best smartphone in the world and no connection. What good is it to you then? How much of what it's meant to do can it do? You're gonna discard it very quickly because without a connection, without the internet, it's gonna be limited what you can do. The gymnastics promise greatness. You have the knowledge of what that greatness should be once you've done the exercise, exercises, but none of the insight that lies behind the greatness. Were they to ever produce from their ranks anyone to equal those greats? Ask them that same question, what made you so great? And what would they say? What would they be able to tell you about the brace, for example? Or the turn as they'd be calling it? Because they've no idea that the turn is the incorrect term for the brace. Take away the gymnastics, the volume control, the retardandos and accelerandos, what would they be left with? That, that, that will be a, like an indicate, something to support what I'm saying, because when I say all they know is volume control and, 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 in the, and their gymnastics, their exercises, their rotation, all that, those watching this, hearing that would be thinking, what can I say if I can't talk about volume control? What can I say if I can't tell my students to add retardandos or accelerandos? What can I tell them if I can't tell them about rotation or you know, grouping or give them some clever exercises and how to master technically difficult bits? I have nothing to tell them anymore after that. So that can be, it shows that that's all they have because I am, you know, they, they, they will not want anybody seeing this because I am taking away from them everything they have. And that is part of what I said in that quote by Kierkegaard, you know, about being a pupil of possibility. In the face of possibility, you'll lose everything. You stand to lose everything, and it's how you behave in the face of that. And, and even if you were in the world were to get everything tenfold, so in the cage, if you were to have a nice position where, where you feed off others in the cage and you can have your, you know, your Nespresso machine and whatever it is that, that, that tries, that you will buy to try and fill that hole, the emptiness inside you. Even when you get all those things, it'll be nothing compared to what you get. Otherwise, because this pupil of possibility will receive infinity. So that is the loss one goes through in order to escape the cage. Everything that belongs to the cage has to be left behind in the cage and you have to enter sort of a poor man in a way, for the want of a better word. But you will then, what you are gaining, once you leave the cage will be infinity. So it'll, the, the riches will start to pile on. And, and you'll find out that you don't even need to own any of the riches, they are there they are a part of the world you're living in. 
that person as a product of the cage would have done it by definition without any insight into music. They'll have done it with gymnastic and memorized definitions. But it will never be that the cage produces a pianist of the caliber of Bach, Mozart and Beethoven. Thus what does mediocrity do instead? It eradicates genius. As long as there are no giants around to establish scale, Lilliput can conceal their true size. And it's ironic, but a Juilliard student, let's say, after paying thousands and thousands of dollars for their education, they'll be in a position where they can't afford to listen to any of this. Isn't that hilarious? They, they'll pay us a small fortune or even a big fortune for the education. And it, what does that education do? It puts them in a position where they can't afford to listen to anything that I'm saying, to, to learn any of the truths that I am I'm, I'm, I'm putting out there. They have to get rid of me because it's too much. You know, it's like that saying, it's harder for a rich man for, for, you know, large rope to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They, it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? They can afford the tuition fees of, of a place like Juilliard, but they can't afford to listen to this that's being presented, shared for free. So if you can afford to listen to this, you can see how, how rich you are. You, 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 you can afford to do something they can't afford to do. They can't afford to learn that their education, that they forked out a fortune for, is crap. Of course, there'll be other things you're paying for, like the facilities that, that the university will offer. Like they'll probably have the best pianos that uh, uh, like pianos as good as any university will have so that'll be one thing you're paying but if you think of the money you pay for that are you not better off buying a great piano for yourself the other thing is yeah you'll have the connection because Lilliput rules the world so you'll have it opens doors the name so you're paying for that if you're if your education isn't worth anything well at least the you know the fact that Lilliput ruled the world will be worth something that you'll be able to exist in Lilliput by dish forking over to them a fortune for your education. But you might be annoyed that, um, you, you know, if you thought you were giving it because of the quality of the education, but you're not at all. And it, not only that, not only is the quality bad, but it cuts you off from something that is of quality. By eating the apple or desiring it, Adam and Eve become more interested in having the knowledge than the knowledge itself. Their sole focus is on its acquisition. You know, they, jump at the, they jumped at the prospect of bypassing the discovery of it. We choose the apple every day and all the time. Adam and Eve could have said, God's knowledge already surrounds us, you know, to the serpent there. He said, you know, the knowledge you're talking about that you get from the apple, it's surrounding us. It's, it's in everything. It's in the trees. It's, it's in the grass. It's in the animal. You know, it's, it's all around us. It's in the air we breathe. That knowledge is around us. We'd rather have that speak to us. We'd rather listen to what that says and what that tells us than eat the apple. The apple is the miracle pill, the original snake oil sold by the serpent. Box hint in paragraph nine will be missed or discarded by those searching for the apple. They want the gymnastics from Bach the same gymnastics they hear on YouTube or from their professors. In their greed for the apple, the roll of honor will miss all the insight contained within the pages of Bach's book. P. 
people will read that book, you know, to be able to put it on their CVs or, you know, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be looking for the, 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 to get it, to eat the apple to bite into and, and, and not soaking up what's there, spending time with it, noticing what it is. Those in the cage will be able to prattle off the meaning of tempo rubato, for example. But never in a million years will they be able to spot it in the music of Mozart or Haydn, as ex just to name two examples. They will not spot, you will not have se heard, seen those, that tempo rubato in the sonatas of Mozart or Haydn or Beethoven spotted by the role of honor, by Lilliput. Why? Because they've all eaten the apple and they're cut off from the world of music. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and were cut off from the tree of life. The tree of life is the world of music. The garden of Eden is the world of music. The reality is though, Adam and Eve excluded themselves. They excluded, they excluded themselves from that. Were they still, they were still in Eden after eating the apple. They just couldn't see it because they'd entered the cage. This is of course my interpretation, but Eden existed. And, and you can see it on, on like how both can be true. So they never left Eden after eating the apple. They were still there. But what happened, they entered the cage. So there's Eden and there's the cage and they're in the cage. So theoretically, they're not in Eden anymore because they're in the cage, but the cage is in Eden. So technically as well, they are still in Eden. And of course, this is my interpretation. And it would mean that Eden is, you know, when you think of it like what I, how I would have think, thought of it as a, as a kid or how you'd understand it is that it's kind of Eden is enclosed in a wall that, that, that Adam and Eve were, or we were banished from, we didn't get access to. But in reality, so, so that e, the Garden of Eden is inside the wall. Whereas in reality, the Garden of Eden is outside the wall and we're the ones inside the wall. The apple didn't need to be magic. That's why I called it a placebo. It became what the serpent told them it was. It, so it was an ordinary apple. That's the, I think that's the kind of the, 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 the hilarious bit about it. And I could interpret the serpent as being advertising or as those, in, as those in the cage who prey on others in the cage, or as our alter ego, as our fear of failure or our fear of not knowing. I mean, the serpent could be any of those things in the, you know, if you understand it as an, in the allegorical sense and not take it literally. And the way I say that we're in the cage and the Garden of Eden is, is there. You know, when I was a kid, reading it or hearing it, I, I, I thought, ah, oh, why did they have to eat the apple? If only they didn't eat the apple and we could all be in the Garden of Eden. But if you think about it, if, if that was the case that we are, were banished from the Garden of Eden by, because, you know, Adam and Eve ate the apple, that would mean, if you think about the, the world today, if, if you think like, you know, I'm not, talking about, I'm just talking about an example, like somebody who's shut in in their, in their, in their house and, and they have the blinds drawn and they just watch TV all day and, and they don't do anything. They, they'd be maybe types to say, oh, the world is shit. You know, to not think of anything good, that the world has anything good in it. Whereas if you think of anybody who, who observes 
the world outside, you know, like a, a zoologist or a, a geologist or, you know, somebody studying bees or whatever. I'll bet you hear from all of them what a miraculous, wondrous place the planet is, existence is, that they'll, they'll have discovered things that just blew their minds of, of, of insects, plants, living organisms, just weather, all these things. And, and, and if, if it was the case that we were banned from Eden, it should be them who this come to the discovery that it's all crap, you know, that this is a crap place. But it's not. The close, those people who look closer, discover the miracle, the wonders of it, will say, yes, this is a miraculous place. So that would be a, a sort of an argument to support me saying that Eden is on the outside of the cage. And I think in terms of, I think it's funny if you think, let's say, like, you know, understanding these things as, as allegorical and not taking them literally. And, and when you think of all the arguments about like dinosaurs and stuff and, and how the, the, the Bible didn't account, this couldn't possibly be true. You know, they, they, they discount all the wisdom because I think Adam and Eve is a brilliant story and it reflects like like an you know our our struggle of becoming pupils of possibility our struggle to to discover the 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 the, the wisdom the riches in the world it's it's a great story and and it's funny how all that will be missed because of of the how you know the wondering how literal it is and people are saying well it doesn't account for dinosaurs and what about evolution and I was thinking it'd be hilarious if in 2000 years people were to come back in time and what they'd want to do with us now would be to, to challenge us on how animal farm couldn't possibly have happened. And they'll have all the evidence like how, how come 2000 years later pigs are, are only grunting and, and in their pigsty? And, and there is no way they'd be able to take over a farm, let alone manage it and, and, and do trade with other farmers in the vicinity. So how is it that 2000 years ago, pigs were able to do that? And we'd be saying to them, well, it was just a story. It wasn't literal. It was a metaphor. <laughs> Imagine that, like how, how, like, like what profound understanding does one need to understand that a story might not necessarily be literal? And what if we traveled back 2000 years ago when the Bible first came out or whenever the Bible first came out and we were told them it didn't really happen like that. What if they were to go, what if they were to go, yeah, duh, of course, it's a story. It's not about it actually happening. What's, what, what it's there for is to, is to communicate a certain wisdom. Or, you know, there's a reason for the story. And, and, and the story doesn't have to be literal to have value. <laughs> you know, that'd be funny, wouldn't it? Why wouldn't they understand the story as being, you know, a story? And they might say, yeah, the Bible is not a scientific book. This is a, a spiritual book, a book on religion. It's not, a, not about, they're not, it's not a scientific look at the, the evolution of the world. What happened 2, year, in 2000 years? Did you lose the ability to um, understand things on, on, a, on a different level than the mere literal level? Hmm. So, yeah, so I just wanted to stress the uniqueness and importance of what it is Bach is doing here. 
So he is doing something none of Lilliput, none of the Roll of Honor do, which is actually tell you about the world of music. You wouldn't believe how many things Lilliput, the role of honor, are doing because they have no concept of the world of music, of how, of, of laws of nature, of how things exist in the world of music. And they're trying to overcome everything with finger exercises, with a metronome, with, with an idea of finger independence. It's ridiculous. And Somebody should come along to say, yes, it all worked for me. And they should give exactly how many repetitions it took them for it to work. Because I know that person doesn't exist and I know there's no number of repetitions that will work, that'll actually clinch it and, and have them be able to do the impossible. So that is the uniqueness and importance of what it is Bach is doing. He was doing something that nobody does. He did that in 1753 with YouTube and all. Nobody is doing that. They don't spot incorrectly placed braces, for example, and 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 ones that are impossible. Make the, 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 it, it cut off your access to the music completely. They don't spot it because they don't know about it. So this is unique and important what Bach is doing by saying that you don't use the brace with fast notes descending. And on another level, this information will be useful should you encounter such, such a situation. You can see Bach provided us an additional example of how figure 53 will be performed in Presto as well the hastening of the uppermost tone. And when Bach says you can trill a complete octave and further, one could wonder, does he say and further because what we see in the example is C major. And so when he says and further, will he be thinking that, Will he be thinking to that C beyond the octave when he says that? That's just a little extra I'll add in there. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now and I'll pick up where I left off in the next video. Thanks. Bye.